Hi. Uh, speaking of speaker notes, where are they? Um, well, hi, my name is Michael. Uh, I work on the Go team at Google, um, on, primarily on the Go runtime. And um, this talk is going to be about a new feature coming in Go 119, um, which allows a Go developer to set a memory limit for their Go application. And the Go 119 release is currently scheduled for August, so coming really soon. Okay, so but what is what is the what is the memory limit feature? What does that actually mean? What can you do with it? Um, and that's what I'm going to talk about um, in this talk. Um, okay, there we go. Um, and uh, if you're at all familiar with the history of sort of like Go runtime parameters and stuff, the Go team has in general been pretty. Um, allergic, opposed, uh, or, or sort of like careful um, because there's a lot of good reasons not to have uh, too many of them. Um, but we felt this one was important enough to include. Um, so let's start by motivating the feature. So throughout this talk, I'm going to be talking about the Go Garbage Collector a lot. And um, I'm going to just refer to it f for short um, as the GC. Uh, you're not expected to kind of know all the details, but I hope you have at least some understanding. Um, in a nutshell, the garbage collector uh, manages a subset of um, the memory of your Go application, and uh, that subset is typically the, um, we, what we call the heap, is typically uh, what the Go compiler can't find space for at compile time, so at runtime, there's a whole system to figure out where to put the memory and to recycle it. So that's what the heap is. I'm going to be referring to the heap a lot. So live heap memory is what the garbage collector, which it does work to discover what uh, memory is actually still in use by the Go application. Um, and new memory is memory that's been allocated the GC, that the GC has not had a chance to look at yet. Um, and so it may or may not be live, and uh, the GC will you know, discover that when it actually runs. So, that was all a lot of words. Let's put that into a graph. And we're going to be looking at this graph a lot in this presentation. So I'm going to spend some time going really deep into it, and then hopefully everything will be clear after that. Um, so uh, first of all, let's just focus entirely on heat memory. Let's pretend that nothing else is, um, memory is not being used in any other way by, the Go, by this Go application. So this graph shows a Go application allocating new heat memory at a constant rate, the dark blue uh, section is uh, the, the live heap that the GC discovers, and the light blue section is new heap memory. So as you can see in, like, in between these dotted lines, the uh, application allocates new memory, and at some point the GC executes. Um, at some point it decides to execute, and that's this, what this like, slope down to zero for new heap represents. And you can see that sometimes that slope, slope down to zero can just be going straight to the side if all memory is live. Um, and uh, so that sort, of, that sort of loop that you know, the application allocates, the GC executes, that is considered a GC cycle. And that's what I'm going to refer to as a GC cycle. Um, lastly, for the sake of this talk, assume that um, we have what's called a stop the world garbage collector, that the, gar the application is completely paused while the garbage collector is running. You may know this is not how the garbage collector actually works, but that's, uh, that's okay. All of this is going to generalize. So, um, and uh, it just dramatically simplifies talking about all this. Okay, so let's just go one step deeper so that this graph is crystal, crystal clear. So, at the beginning here, we have an initialization phase for our application where it, um, uh, every GC cycle, the GC discovers that all live heat memory is, uh, all, all new heat memory is live. And um, that happens for three cycles, and you can see we start with zero live memory, and then at the, uh, at the fourth one, there's only a little bit of it that's live. And then in this section, um, the um, application is allocating at a steady rate, 
and either all new memory is not live or some portion of the live heap is dying in equal amount to how much of new memory is being allocated. Um, for the sake of this talk, those situations are equivalent. We're, we only care about the raw amounts of new heap and live heap. Okay, so one thing I omitted in all this is what, when does the GC actually decide to execute? And today, that is primarily controlled by a tuning parameter called GoGC. And in this graph, that's called, um, that the GoGC value is 100, which is the default value. Okay, what does that mean? Well, the official definition here is on the slide, um, and it's, a, it's like a target percentage, but I find it more intuitive to think about um, as overhead. So a GoGC of 100 is 100% 100 overhead uh, over your live heap, so um, it's 2x. 200 is 200% uh, or 3x. 50 is 50% 50 or 1.5x. So, back to our original picture, um, notice that the live heap is at uh, 20 megabytes, and the peak memory use around the two second mark is uh, 40 megabytes. So this squares with our uh, GoGC value. So I want you to take note of the um, GC CPU percent here, this overhead that we've simulated for our little application, and um, take note of that 6% number, because we're going to try a few other uh, GoGC values and see what happens. So this is what GoGC equals 200 means, right? Um, the live heap is still 20 megabytes, but now our peak memory usage is 60. Um, so this is 3x, as I, as I explained before. Also notice the decrease in GC CPU overheads to 3.8%. Um, and what I want you to take note is there's a fundamental trade-off here. Um, there are fewer peaks in this cycle, so the GC frequency is, is lower at the cost of additional memory. Um, and the reason why GC frequency is sufficient to sort of describe the CPU costs is because the actual execution time is composed of two parts, a fixed cost and a marginal cost that's proportional to um, uh, the live heap. And that, that's, a, that's a cost per GC cycle. So simply having fewer cycles for the same live heap means we spend less time uh, in the GC. Um, And in this sense, it's important to recognize that um, the live heap is sort of fundamental to your application. At any given point in time, uh, you can, uh, like the GC is like taking a, a snapshot sort of of what it sees is actually live, but at any given point in time, some amount of memory is going, some subset of the heap memory is going to be live. All right. Um, so let's take a look at what that means for GoGC equals 50, just to, just to get a look in the other direction. Here you can see many more peaks. Um, we're only using 30 megabytes peak, still 20 megabytes live, and 11% overall. So the whole point of GoGC is to give you control over this CPU memory trade-off. The cost of your application, in terms of just raw resources, some of it's going to come from this uh, CPU, and some of it's going to cost uh, come from memory. And uh, this lets you GoGC lets you find that sweet spot. Maybe you care more about memory. Maybe you care more about CPU. Maybe you care more about latency. And uh, latency is sort of outside of the topic of this, uh, outside of the scope of this talk. But um, I'll give you some resources for that uh, at the end. Um, Okay, so now that we've got that picture really, really clear, um, let's take a look at a new application. So this one is very similar to the last one, except that now we have this uh, transient increase in the live heap. Um, the, tra the increase happens somewhere between the five and six second mark, and uh, the GC notices it at the GC cycle at the six second mark. Then between uh, the... Uh, six and seven uh, second mark, the live heap drops again, and there's, uh, and the GC notices it at around 7.5 seconds. So 
So if we turn GoGC all the way down, we can see what this looks like. We can see the actual contour of the, of the application. Um, because the GC is effectively constantly running, so the, so the actual total heap use is very, very close to the live heap. And this is just to kind of um, really, really drive this home. So now that we know this, how about we try to use GoGC to find the right balance between CPU and memory for this application? So let's say that we run this uh, application in a 60 megabyte container, because that's what we could find as uh, the cheapest price. And it just so happens that our application fits really, really snugly into this uh, 60 megabyte container. Um, but we're leaving a lot of memory on the table. All of this memory we have in the container anyway. We could be using it to, uh, to execute fewer GC cycles. Yeah. So let's, as an experiment, let's just try turning GoGC up to 200 and play around and see what happens. So we do that, and it works out. We're definitely executing fewer GC cycles, and we're, uh, we're definitely doing better in terms of the shaded area in some ways. But now we're exceeding the memory limit, um, and uh, that's, that's not great. Um, and Goji, because GoGC is defined proportionally like this, um, like you, like this, this situation is a bit contrived. But you could, this could just happen because you're unlucky. Like let's say you have a web service, and most of the time it looks like um, seconds two to three. But then uh, you don't really expect it. You just get a load spike. So, so as a result of that behavior, you set GoGC equals 200. And then you get a load spike, and suddenly you start running out of memory. Um, and uh, you know, this can sort of happen when you least expect it. And so sometimes in these sort of constrained environments, uh, tuning GoGC can feel a little bit dangerous. And the, this is where the memory limit comes in. Uh, since GoGC is just a proportion, it's completely unaware of memory limits. Um, and we can do better. So let's see what that would look like. So back to this graph, what if we could set a 60 megabyte memory limit? So this is what it would look like, and that, looks, that works great. We have one additional GC cycle in this whole thing, um, so we're paying a slightly higher CPU cost, but we do end up staying under the limit. Uh, on top of that, we still get the benefits of GoGC equals 200 for a bunch of these other uh, cycles. But we can still do better, because there's still a bunch of memory that, uh, that we could be using. So what's, the, the, the trick here is to try to turn GoGC up as high as it can possibly go. What's the highest GoGC value? The highest GoGC value is off. <laughs> um, so before the introduction of a memory limit, this was equivalent to disabling the GC entirely, um, which would basically mean that it, the graph looks just like this light blue section on the left, except all the way you know, to infinity, right? Your, your application just keep allocating. Um, but with the memory limit, it reveals that what it really means is that GoGC, equal, GoGC equals off means GoGC equals infinity. Um, the GC still has to respect the memory limit, so it still, uh, it still executes and triggers. Um, but it'll never actually trigger as a result of um, the GoGC setting. So this setting maximizes our resource economy because at this point, there's nowhere left to shade in. And we can't use the memory in between the peaks because we're going to need that memory in the near future anyway. Or rather, we, we, um, we can't like, get rid of that memory or, or you know, there's nothing we can do about that. That's just the cost of, of a GC and of allocating and freeing memory in batches. And one thing I want to be absolutely clear on is this entire time I was talking about a memory limit, but because we were just looking at the heap, I could have easily called it a heap limit. But I want to stress that this is a memory limit. So we've ignored other memory sources thus far, but the actual feature that's coming does, um, does actually take into account all the source of, sources of memory in the Go application, and it'll, ev uh, it'll even return memory to the OS eagerly to try to maintain this memory limit. 
And the additional memory here is represented as other mem in this sort of like very, very dark section. Um, and, you know, like I mean, th this could be Goroutine stacks, GC metadata, various data structures, um, anything that the Go runtime is aware of. And so it's, it's important to take note that this doesn't include like C memory or let's say like uh, memory that the kernel, uh, like the, the OS holds on to, on behalf of your uh, application and then charges your application for it, say in a container environment. Um, so a good rule of thumb is to always give like still five to 10% of headroom. Um, but if you're familiar with other uh, languages implementations of the same thing, um, it, they typically are just heap limits. And so uh, we kind of hope that the fact that this is a memory limit means that it's a lot easier to set a value instead of having to just guess um, and then inevitably be wrong one day. Um, Okay, so this all seems great, but um, if I'm completely honest, the implementation of everything that we've talked about so far is not very complicated. Um, and why didn't we just do this before? If clearly this is so important, right? It's been, it's been I don't know how many years since, since GoGC was introduced, right? And uh, clearly we've just had this thing. And, and like, you know, even that extra insight about it being a memory limit over a heap limit isn't really all that um, novel and like you know the the Java ecosystem has has had something like uh, a heap limit for a very very long time um, so as usual there's a problem at the core of this that makes it harder to do right so starting again with our last graph um, let's see what happens when we reduce the memory limit closer and closer to the live heap um, and I want you to pay attention to the GCCPU time, the GCCPU numbers, and also just the general contour of the graph. Um, okay, so first we're gonna go down to 50. So far, so good. Now 45, okay. Um, why 45? Well, I'm gonna inch closer and closer to 40. Um, you might suspect that something is going to happen at 40. Now we're executing quite a few GC cycles in that region at 40.5 megabytes. And uh, now we can't maintain the memory limit anymore. We've hit, we've um, set the memory limit at the point where the um, heap has no room to grow, but nevertheless, it grows because it needs some runway, right? Um, and notice that the GCCPU percentage went up to 55%, but in that region right there, it's actually much worse <laughs> than, than 55%. Um, and to the point where the application is struggling to make progress. And this is called thrashing, and it's a really serious issue. Um, and it's arguably worse than just running out of memory, because if you, that happens, you can just, you know, especially if you just get unlucky, you can just restart your container. Um, but uh, this can cause your application to just kind of stall indefinitely. So the main problem uh, was with, with just doing this, which is adding a memory limit, was trying to figure out a mitigation strategy. So after some research, oh, that's, that's fun formatting. I wonder if the other slides are gonna be like that. Um, after some research, uh, we found one that we felt good about. Um, and though it's certainly possible that we might change this in the future. So consider this an implementation detail, but um, this is how we're mitigating it today. Uh, the basic idea is to limit GCCPU time directly and force the application to run. So by doing this, the GC has to let the application keep allocating. So we're taking a stance here that yes, running out of memory is probably better than completely stalling and thrashing. Um, and uh, this also applies to the uh, Go Runtime's efforts to return memory to the OS. So it might you know, be less aggressive about that uh, in the face of this. Um, and uh, the intuition behind this 50% is that in the event of a misconfiguration, the application, like say you have ample memory headroom, but you accidentally set the memory limit too low, then at least in throughput or, or, or in like ex raw execution time, you should basically execute no worse than 2x because your application will have half the available CPU time. Um, and uh, to be clear, the CPU time is defined by the runtime parameter go max procs, uh, which is, I, I won't go into here, but um, 
it kind of defines the amount of parallelism. And, and the Go runtime uses this for basically every measure of uh, CPU time. Um, so the 2x rule is a little bit hard to guarantee in practice, but as a rule of thumb, it seems to hold up in testing. Uh, note that I mentioned here a two second window. Uh, the purpose of that is so that there's some hysteresis. And um, if the, like there are many reasons why the GC might need to temporarily use a lot of extra CPU time. And this gives it one second, like one, basically one CPU second per available CPU that it has to, uh, um, you know, get that in before it starts getting limited. Um, and uh, that, that also kind of points to the fact that we're, we're interested here persist, uh, specifically about persistent um, thrashing situations, not this just sort of like uh, transient situations. We don't want the GC to behave more erratically um, uh, by setting this rule um, over all time. And uh, yeah, again, take these parameters as what they are today. They might change over time. We might change the strategy altogether, but the stance is going to remain the same. Um, OK, so while the mitigation strategy definitely appears to be effective, um, there's still a risk with using the memory limit. So I have a few uh, rules of thumb. Uh, these are not hard and fast rules, so definitely feel free to experiment. Probably not in production. Um, but, uh, you know, give it a try, see how, see how your application reacts, and you can always fall back on these rules of thumb, which should be very safe. Okay, so the main intended use case of this is uh, um, to improve resource efficiency when you have a single pure Go binary running in a container, and this is a great time to use it. Um, just set your memory limit, set GoGC to off, five to 10% headroom, and, you know, let it go wild. Um, and this is especially important that you fully control the environment that you're, so you know the size of the container and you're deploying to that size of container. But if your Go program might be running in an environment you don't have control over, like a CLI tool or a desktop application, uh, shipping with a memory limit set will probably do more harm than good uh, and lead to poor performance. Because um, you don't know, you don't know what necessarily what inputs your tool is gonna get, you don't know necessarily um, how much memory uh, your um, user has. Uh, so the memory limit uh, can be used in situations where it shares uh, memory with, uh, with neighbors, um, like either other processes or libraries. The best case scenario for this kind of looks like um, you have a C Go program and you're calling into a C library that you know temporarily is going to use a lot of memory, then that's probably a good time to adjust the memory limit on the fly. And you can do that with the set memory limit API. Um, if, uh, if the memory use of, like, say, a co-tenant process is stable and predictable, um, then it's also probably fine to use, the, uh, to use the memory limit. You may just want to check on it periodically and adjust the memory limit um, on the fly, uh, you know, just to make sure there aren't any surprises. That's, a, that's a, I think, a pretty common and useful pattern. Um, so in the case of multiple programs that don't talk to each other, like, let's say we, cr we uh, decide to cram 10 copies of the same Go web service into a single container, it might be tempting to give each of them 10% of the memory um, and set GoGC to off for all of them. The problem is they're all going to be using that full 10% uh, all the time, and you're uh, putting yourself more at risk of thrashing, especially if let's say if GoGC were lower, you might have um, some available headroom because the other, uh, say, co-tenant copies don't actually need that memory right now. So it like, might be okay to just let one of them uh, use a little bit more memory shortly. And that's typically gonna be a much more robust solution. So like, what I would suggest in that case is say, like, give each of them uh, 20, give each of the 10 copies 20%, so you're over committing. Um, but what you, what you get there is two things. Uh, and, and set GoGC to some reasonable value, like 100, 250, something like that. And what, what you get there is that if one process really needs the memory, you're not going to thrash and you're not going to, you're unlikely to thrash and you're unlikely to take down the container. But if all of them suddenly need it, then you don't have this thrashing risk um, and you get your you know, fail fast um behavior, uh, which is arguably better. Um, 
And lastly, and this is maybe, you know, if you take any tidbit away, don't set a memory limit uh, to avoid an outer memory condition when the program is already close to the limit. It's not going to help. You're trading uh, one problem for another. Um, at this point, it's best to, you know, um, dig down, do some optimization work, and uh, just, or, or, or just increase your, the amount of memory you have available. And speaking of optimization work uh, and latency and all the stuff that I didn't go to in this guide, if you want a <laughs> much more detailed and rigorous um, sort of exploration of all these things and uh, the, you know, all of this advice is in there, please check out this new shiny uh, GC guide, um, which, yeah, like I said, goes into a lot more detail and it has an optimization guide also for how to uh, reduce the overhead of the GC in your application. Thank you. That's, that's my whole talk. Thank you.